Amen. Let's give the Lord another round of applause. Can we do that? Man, what a beautiful message. You know, to, to run to the Father again and again and again. Can I get an amen? Man, that's awesome. We welcome you this morning. If you're first time, let me see you raise your hand. First time in the streeters are here. What's up, guys? First time in the room. We are seeing people. God bless you. We welcome you, and we welcome coffee back into this place. It's not one of our values here, but somehow it has become quite the thing. It goes back to those early years of setup of the church plant. You know, our coffee culture goes even before I got here, you know, setting up at six in the morning, uh, there was always coffee prepared. And so uh, you see in your seats there, there are cup holders. Please use your cup holders with the coffee. And ladies, just so you know, if you set anything on the floor and someone spills their coffee up top, you're going to get coffee in your purse. And so just be aware of that. And so, again, we welcome this back. Man, we're trying to get back to some normalcy, but it's great to see you in the room. We are here this morning. Amen? Amen. Regardless of the week that you had, regardless of the opposition, you are here this morning. We are in the house of God. Amen? Amen. We are with other believers. We are worshiping corporately, and we're going to open God's Word. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Romans. This is our pep rally. As we leave this place, we head out, amen? As we leave this place, we head out into the world. The Bible says to be light and darkness. Many of you are in dark places, and the place that you live are the place that you work, and God has called you to be an ambassador of light. And so this is the time that we as believers come together. We huddle around God's word. We get energized. We get motivated. We get anointed in the Holy Spirit, and then we head out to do the work that God's called us to do. And so I'm excited about this series, Romans chapter six. The title of the series is Dying to Live, right? And the message is really Galatians 2.20, where, where Paul tells us, like truly, what is the verse that sums up what it means to live the Christian life? Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. I mean, here's this picture that Paul is saying that, that the old me is dead, that in order for there to be life, there has to be death. And we talked about this last week, that we die to our sins as Christ died and was buried, but that he conquered it. And so therefore, we are alive in Christ to now walk in newness of life. So we've been working through Romans 6. Last week, we kind of took 12 verses there and kind of moved through kind of quickly. So this morning, we're going to hover a little bit kind of at the end. So Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 14 is really going to kind of be the passages that we're going to look at. And then next week, uh, we'll finish up this chapter of chapter 6. But look at what he says in verse 2. We don't have to stand yet. In just a minute, we're going to stand. But look at what he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And we know a lot of this goes back to chapter 5, verse 20, right, where, where he says, you know, where, where sin abounds, what does he say? Grace abounds more. And so the argument is, okay, okay, Paul, if there's no works involved in our salvation, if we're truly justified by faith, then really doesn't that give us a license to sin? Like, like really doesn't that just kind of give us a, a freedom to do what we want? And so he is responding to really that question. And he says there in verse 10, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? The core message is that our relationship has now changed to sin. And so what you find in Romans 6, really he speaks of freedom. And I don't know of any believer who would say, man, I desire freedom in my life, right? I desire to run the race with endurance that God has called me, right? As, as he says, you know, lay down everything that easily ensnares us, those sins. And I think we would all have to say that we have a desire for that freedom in our lives. And I, and I believe a true child of God will have it. If you've truly been born again, there's a desire in your heart and the Holy Spirit to move towards God. But we know that there's opposition there. And so Romans 6 really speaks of this freedom. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, obviously, but it says that a true believer will have that desire for holiness, to be less like who we used to be and to be more like Jesus. Listen to these words. Paul says this in the next chapter in Romans 7, verse 15. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Notice that word there. To hate, to see now sin the way God sees sin in our lives. That now in the Holy Spirit, the light has been turned on. That now in the Holy Spirit, we have a clear view of the destruction that is caused by this thing we call sin. And Paul says, understand something, right? There's freedom here, that you're not fighting for victory, that you're, you're called to walk in it because Christ conquered it all. 
That's why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins. That word confess means to say the same thing. When we see our sins and we say the exact same thing about it that God says. And so what must we do, man? We gotta have a, a game plan because spiritual warfare is a real thing, right? In the life of the believer, we know that if you have a desire to serve the Lord, if you have a desire in this process of sanctification for freedom to be different from who you used to be, then you know that there's opposition, that there's a battle that is raging and we can't see it. And the enemy loves to downplay it. And so many times we as Christians, right, we just stumble into the battlefield of life and we wonder why we're no match. And so Paul says here, man, there's preparation involved. There's understanding involved. There's the power of God involved in winning this battle of victory in our lives. So we've got to develop a game plan. When I was in college, I was overwhelmed by the amount of time that is spent scouting the other team. When I was playing basketball in college, someone used to say, well, you played for ODU. No, I watched for ODU. I didn't really play that much. I had a very good view of the games, right? And so I was on the scout team is what I was. And so as a walk-on, you're running the plays of the other team. And it was always my dream when the other team, when their, when their guard was their best player, because then on the scout team, I got freedom to do whatever I want to do. But I was always amazed with how much time went into scouting the op opponent. And I would never think that we would just walk onto the court and say, well, well, I hope we have enough to win with act without actually being disciplined in the battle that was in front of us. So now let's translate that to our spiritual lives. How did you prepare for your battle this week? How'd you do in it? Did you win those little battles in your life? Did you conquer that temptation that came your way? Was there a battle strategy involved? And so here I want to give you three things this morning. Three things this morning. Three words that I'm going to give to you. No, believe, submit. Just keep that as a heading. No, believe, and submit. Because Paul says, listen, you want this victory in your life? It's already been won by Christ, but now we got to walk in it. And in order to walk in it, there's some things we must do. Number one, we must know. We must put a period. I want you to notice where this word is used. Look at verse 3 of Romans 6. We haven't stood yet. Take your Bibles and stand with me in reverence of reading God's Word. What's y'all's problem, man? How irreverent. Y'all stand with me. I <laughs> can't believe y'all wouldn't do that. Romans 6. Let's go to verse 11 down to verse 14. We kind of landed in 12, 11 and 12 last week, but let's just hover here this morning. I want you to see what Paul is saying, and then next week we're going to get into the end of the chapter where he uses the metaphor of slavery. Our pastors and I, we talked a lot this past week about what Paul is doing there with this metaphor. But this morning, let's just kind of hover here 11 through 14. Look what he says. Likewise, connecting us back to the last 10 verses, you also, notice this phrase here, reckon yourselves. Notice that. Reckon yourselves. Affirm yourselves. Declare yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members, notice that language there, it's the same language of Romans 12, of presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. It's temple language here, presenting a sacrifice. Notice what he says, and do not present your members as instruments of righteous, unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Declare this. Look at what it says. For you are not under law, but you are under, say it with me. Man, there's got to be excitement about that right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we are not under the law. We are under grace. And Lord, as we reflect upon grace, we see a Savior. We see Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came and did what we could not do who came and met your standards with his life, not a sinful deed, not a sinful thought, pure holiness, so that when he went to the cross, he would be a substitute for us. And as your word tells us that there upon the cross, Christ exhausted your wrath. He exhausted your judgment, the wrath and judgment that we deserve for our sins that we have committed but yet we stand before you in grace, Lord. May we never get over that, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our struggles, to know that in grace, we stand before you clean, holy, blameless because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We proclaim that in this place this morning. We start with that in this place this morning. May we know it. And as we know it, may we live it. We pray it, we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, I'm gonna preach this morning, y'all ready? It's only my second time in the room. I've had a couple of Nespresso's. Here we go. No, 
he says we got to know. So it begins with our minds, right? I mean, we talk about the battle of the minds. Romans 12 talks about the renewing of the minds. But Paul says there are some things you got to know. That when you begin your day, there are some things you got to know. That when you step out from your front porch, there are some things you got to know. That you're not debating, that you're not questioning, that you know. Well, what is it that we know? Look at verse 3. Do you not know, he says, that as many as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. So he says, okay, know that you died with Christ. Your sins buried with Christ. Know that. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Look at verse 9. Knowing, again, same word, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. You go to verse 16. You see it again. Do you not know? What is Paul saying? Know this, know this, know this, that every day in the life of the believer, there's a battle for truth. Let's be real. There's a battle for truth in our lives. And every day we're being bombarded with lies. We're being bombarded with lies in the world that we live in. We're being bombarded with lies, even with our own emotions and flesh. It leads us astray. So what do we need? We need truth. And where is truth found? It's found right here in God's word. He says to know, what are we to know? We are to know what is done. We are to know what is finished. We are to know that when Jesus cried those words, it is finished, to know that every day now I'm walking in that, I know that. And that's a big deal in the first step of victory. That this is a doctrinal statement to know in our minds that Christ is victorious, therefore we are too. Think about what Jesus says in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Where is it found? It's found right here. Let me ask you a question. How's your feeding going? Critical in the life of the believer is his word right here that we feed upon truth. This week, how'd you feed? Did you have a buffet of truth this past week? I mean, let's be real because if, if we're not spending time in truth, the lies are still coming and I believe the enemy even brings them more. And what happens is our filter gets distorted rather than looking through the lens of truth and looking through the lens of how does God see this and how does God see this situation? We now look through the lens of our pain and our emotions and our feelings and they lie to us. So Paul says, no, no, put your minds on truth. Put your mind here and know the finished work of Christ. Look at what he says in six and seven, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Two things he tells us to know, that we are dead to sin and we are free from sin. Jesus said these words in John 8, 34, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin, he says this, is a slave of sin. This is the way we enter into this world, a slave of sin in Adam. But notice what he says in this transition, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. It's a done deal is what Paul is saying. That if that is not your starting point, then you're gonna be crippled from the get-go. Because you're trying to reconcile in your mind. He says, no, know that it is done, D-O-N-E, that our salvation is not due. It is not D-O. Our salvation is D-O-N-E, finished, done by the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, know that. Because if you don't know that first, you can't get to the next step. That if you don't know that, and if that's not your starting point, you're already in handcuffs as you're trying to move forward. Look, no longer a slave to sin, now a child of the king. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, understand this. Jesus just didn't come to save us from hell. Jesus came to save us from sin. And there's a difference there. I think sometimes we can easily come to a place of justification, sometimes quicker than sanctification. Oh, I'm saved. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'm cool with that. Sometimes it's easier to get there than it is the process of sanctification. Okay, by the power of Christ, not only am I saved from from the penalty of sin, the Bible says I'm saved from the power of sin. Do I believe that now in the present moment? Do I believe that now that not only has Christ delivered me from hell, but right now he's delivered me from the authority and the power and the dominion of my sins? That's what Paul is saying. And I think sometimes it's easier for us to get to justification than sanctification because sanctification requires sacrifice. Sanctification requires pain. Sanctification requires giving something up, the hardest thing, which is ourselves. But he says, know this, look at verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Do not let sin have authority. Do not let sin be the king in your life. He is no longer the ruler that you should obey it in its lust. And then he takes us back to verse six, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So here's the game plan. Number one, it begins with knowing truth. 
and declaring it and putting a period on it, not wrestling with it, but knowing when I start my day that victory is established. I know it, but it's got to move beyond knowledge, right? Billy Graham is famous for saying that there are millions of people who will miss heaven by six inches. You ever heard that before? What is he talking about? The distance between what? The head and the heart, right? It's not about just knowing. There are pain people who know. The Bible says that even the demons know and they tremble, but it's got to move you to something. It's not just knowledge and, 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 and information. No, now I'm believing. So here's the second word, believing in our hearts. Look at what he says here in verse 11. Likewise, you also notice this, reckon yourselves. Reckon yourselves. It's an accounting term. It means to affirm it, to put a period on it, to count on it, to bank on it. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's not just just to know. Our knowledge doesn't move us. Our faith moves us. And so Paul says, okay, it's a matter of knowing, but now it's a matter of responding to what we know. And here now, now it goes from the head to the heart. I could write you a check and say, here, I'm writing you a check for $500. Wait, wait till Thursday to cash it, but here's a check for $500. You know in your mind that, okay, there's gonna be money there when you go to the bank. That's one thing, you know it. You believe it when you go to the bank and you cash it. There's a difference between the two. Many times what we know does not move us to action. It's believing it and by faith responding to it. Here's an example, tithing. Uh Uh-oh, watch your feet. Here we go, here we go. (laughs) I would dare to say that most believers would say, yeah, I believe what the Bible says about tithing. I believe in first fruits, and I believe that God says that he will honor those who put him first, not the leftovers, but first. We believe that, we know that. But what moves us in that? Still 20% supports 80% of the church. That's the case here. That 20% of the body of Christ gives to support 80% of the church. And so we know information, but does the knowledge of that information move us to something? Does it move us to say, Lord, not only do I know this and believe this, I trust it. And the someone show that I trust it by acting on it, by responding to it, by giving up my rights and surrendering to it. That's the third word. Here you go. Know, believe, submit. All of this comes back to Romans 12. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna keep coming back to it. Romans 12, Romans 12, Romans 12. I think one of the greatest outlines of Romans 12 is is, uh, presentation plus separation equals transformation. That what does he say? That did you present yourself? Like that's where it begins on a Monday. Okay, Lord, I, I know this. I believe this. I'm responding to this. And so I'm submitting now. I'm submitting myself. I'm going to the altar, a living sacrifice. And I'm separating myself. Do not be conformed to this world. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go upstream, right? I'm going to be aware. By the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be in tune to the, to the whistles and, and, the, and the alarms when the Holy Spirit says, hey, beware. I'm going to seek you, not those things. The Bible says presentation, when you present your bodies. Separation leads to transformation. Like that's the renewing of the mind, and that's where the truth of God's word now changes. The way you see your own stuff. It changes the way you see your pain. It changes the way you see your circumstances. You look beyond just the here and you see the Lord working a little bit over here. Paul says it begins with knowing. It leads to believing, but how do you do that? You gotta submit. You gotta submit to what the Lord is calling you to do. Look at what he says here. He says in verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from God. What is Paul saying? The enemy has no original material. The enemy can only take the work of God in your life and try to distort it and try to pervert it. He has no original material. And so what is he saying? Okay, present your instruments, not for unrighteousness, but present your instruments unto righteousness. I get a chuckle out of this. I was with my family Friday night. That sounded corny. I get a chuckle out of this. But I was with my family Friday night. And my mom said, you can use the illustration of your mouth on this verse of scripture. It's funny to me that God has called me to preach because this mouth has gotten me in trouble my entire life. An instrument for unrighteousness, I pray it's an instrument for righteousness, but for many years, this mouth has gotten me punched in the face a couple of times, I'm just gonna tell you that. And so my mom was like, man, you, you, you can use that as an illustration that you know, your mouth was used unto unrighteousness. You have, a, you have a, a new nose because of your mouth. <laughs> I was a junior in college. It was a walk on ODU. I was playing in the pro-am at Lake Taylor. And we were playing a game, and me and a guy got in a very friendly conversation during the game. Let's just say that. I didn't start it, 
But I didn't end it either. And so yeah, we're going back and forth. And, and at the end of the game, my pants are sitting on the second row. He picks up his dribble. I get up on him and I'm going pressure, ball, 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 ball. He's six foot seven. He looks directly at me, takes his elbow and comes straight down. My entire nose folded over to the right side of my face. So, so I saw stars, I opened my mouth, blood is just, they didn't even call foul, by the way, but anyway, blood, blood's coming out. I'm walking off the court and I see my mom and dad and I see my mom's face. And I'm like, okay, she's never made that face towards me. I go into the bathroom and in a public school, high school, is that metal mirror? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like a fun house mirror? <laughs> and I'm looking at that thing going, no, they ain't, no. And I walk out and my mom hands me a mirror and my nose is laying sideways over my face. This whole side had collapsed. I go to the emergency room. She said, honey, 98% of broken noses don't need surgery. I said, well, that's great. She said, no, you ain't a part of that 98%. <laughs> Three reconstructive surgeries because of an instrument of unrighteousness right here. Three reconstructive surgeries. About five years into our marriage, I asked Amber, I said, what was it that drew you to me? She said, I loved your nose. <laughs> She fell in love with me under false pretenses. Let me just say that. And I said, if God blesses us with a child, you're going to see how busted my nose really was that first time around. Instruments of unrighteousness. We can relate to this. It's where we put it. And if God has your heart, he has your instruments. If God has your heart, he has your hands. If God has your heart, he has your mouth. If God has your heart, he has your feet, right? Pastor Kai is going to send you to the places of the gospel, right? If God has your heart, the instruments will follow. And so here is Paul saying, man, God has changed you. He has redeemed you. Know the finished work of Christ. Believe in the finished work of Christ. Respond to it by submitting and watch the power of God go before you. For far too long, we as Christians have been living in discouragement, thinking that the chains are still on because the enemy is lying. But by the power and the blood of Jesus, those chains have been broken. And on Monday, we can declare it. Paul says, know it and declare it. Know it and profess it. You're not in bondage. You died to those sins. You're now alive in Christ. Believe it in faith. And now submit yourself upon the altar and watch what God will do doesn't mean you're going to always have it easy, of course not. God will take you on a journey. And his presence, his power, I mean, there's no substitute for that. There's nothing that this world can offer to, to match that. We were created for that. And so when a child of God is, is seeking him on Monday and Tuesday and saying, Lord, I'm struggling and I can't do this. I know what you've done. I believe what you've done. And now I'm responding to what you've done. And that's the game plan. Because every day's a battle, man. And if we step out onto this battlefield with no preparation at all, the percentage of victory is very low. And we wonder why. Paul says these instruments can be led to righteousness to build the kingdom of God. But understand, these same interests can be led to unrighteousness that can tear down your life. Remember when I was in seminary, I had a professor that was just, he was one of those guys that just stood out. He was a missionary in Africa for like five years. And so I think it changes a dude. Like when you live out and you're eating berries and leaves and crickets, like I think it changes a dude, you know? So he was changed, like had no TV, no radio, had a beard down to here, like kind of scary looking dude. But he was our professor and he stands out to me. And I remember him teaching on this passage and he was drilling us. It was all just guys in the room, young guys studying to go into the ministry. And he stood on a chair and he said, guys, he said, I can tell you who's winning in your life. I can tell you who has victory or who's here in bondage with pornography or addiction. He said, I can tell you right now, I can tell you straight up who's winning and who's losing simply by this, who's being fed. Are you feeding your flesh? Because understand, if you're feeding your flesh and that comes natural, you gotta fight that, that comes natural, the feeding just goes. If you're feeding your flesh, and that's gonna win. But if you're feeding your spirit, the authority is in the finished work of Christ. And so he would describe these two lions that were fighting. And he would have a picture, like it was, he always had pictures of himself with lions. 
And I thought I'd use this because there's three separate illustrations here. This is what he said. Imagine our lives daily. Spiritual warfare is a battle of two lions, flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit. Who's winning in our lives? Who's winning in our lives? If someone looked at our lives this past week, would there be evidence of change? Would there be evidence of victory? Would there be evidence that Christ has truly done something in our hearts? Who is winning in our lives? And he says, I can tell you right now, it's who you're feeding. And then he said, by the way, understand, Peter describes that as lurking. Peter describes that as that is hidden, that is looking to seek and pounce upon you to destroy your marriage, to destroy your family, to destroy your testimony. He said, understand as believers, we need to know what's at stake. But then he transitioned to this in Revelations 5, going back to Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, when Jacob is naming the 12 tribes, he comes to Judah, his fourth son, and he calls him a cub of a lion. Then you come to verse nine and he says, the scepter shall not leave the hands of Judah. He's declaring kingship. He's declaring authority. Then you come to Romans 5, Revelations 5, and there's the story of who will open the seals. Who is worthy? The one who is worthy is the one who is conquered. The lion of the tribe of Judah, they declare. The lion of the tribe of Judah has won. He has defeated the enemy. And therefore we as his children can walk and live victoriously. With every head bowed and every eye closed. It's not your work. The work has been done. It's not our battle. The battle has been won. And we got to know that up front. We got to know that up front. It's got to move beyond just knowing that. It now has to transition to the heart where we believe that. And if it truly transitions to the heart, there's going to be movement. There's gonna be response. If it truly makes it to the heart, you're gonna find a life that makes sacrifices for the Lord. You're gonna find someone who goes to that altar because how could they not? Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law, but you are under grace, motivated. By grace, Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, I plead with you to reflect upon the mercies of God, the grace of God. And when we enter into the battlefield to know it's done, it's won and believe it, now live it. As we go to that altar and we lay our lives down, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present, this is Monday morning, this is Monday afternoon, this is to, that you present, that you lay it down, that you present, it's an action, of submission, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world, do not look like this world, but be transformed, metamorphosis, be transformed, an ugly little caterpillar that is transformed to a beautiful butterfly. That is the picture of salvation. Are we still crawling around like a caterpillar? Or are we truly living our lives changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm gonna invite you to stand right where you are. We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and Lord, we are humbled by the fact that you would choose to love us. Let's start there. That you would choose to love us, Lord, in spite of us, that we were not seeking you. We were not pursuing you. We were not looking for you, but in spite of us, you came to us. In spite of us, you found us. You rescued us. Lord, so many of us in this place can speak of being rescued. So many in this place can speak of being delivered. But the enemy does not want us to know that, Lord. And so we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, Lord, that we would know each day that our Savior lives, that our Savior is victorious over it all. May that be our starting point. And now as we walk with the chains broken, Lord, may we be used for your glory and your purpose, not for these temporary things here that have no lasting eternal value. Lord, may you set our hearts and minds upon things are set for eternity. Lord, help us in the grind of life to shine bright. That our lights would not be dim, that our lights would not be flickering, but that when others see us, they would see a light that is shining bright, maybe in darkness, maybe in pain, maybe in struggle, but the light of Christ shining bright where there's joy, 
And there's peace that surpasses understanding and it's unique to a lost world. And Lord, may we be quick to give a response of the hope that lies within us, that it's Christ alone that provides us. We proclaim that, we declare that. Lord, help us to live that, to walk each day captivated and changed. May we come into this place next week changed, a little bit more changed to be more like Jesus, our Savior. Lord, I pray if there's one here today who's never called upon your name, it is not a mistake that you've brought them into this place. Lord, I pray that they would hear of a God who loves them and who loves them so much that would die for them. And Lord, I pray for hearts in this place right now that they would run to the Father run to the Father. And Lord, I've been out there and I've been out there in so many different seasons. I've been out there fighting the words of what's being said. And so Lord, I pray in the authority of the resurrection that you would bind the enemy from this place and you would do a work in hearts and lives that change us for eternity. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus. Lord, may we live it. May we speak it. May we not be about ourselves. May we not be about ourselves. May we be about you. We pray it in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday morning.